let me tell you a joke. Somebody apparently once went up to the great philosopher Wittgenstein and said, what a lot of morons people back in the Middle Ages must have been to have looked every morning at what's going on behind me now, the dawn, and to have thought that what they were seeing was the sun going round the earth. Well, as every school kid knows, the earth goes round the sun, and it doesn't take too many brains to understand that. To which Wittgenstein replied, yeah, but I wonder what it would have looked like if the sun had been going round the earth. Point being, of course, it would have looked exactly the same. You see what your knowledge tells you you're seeing. Well, that's what this series is going to be about. How, what do you think the universe is, and how you react to that in everything you do, depends on what you know. And when that knowledge changes, for you, the universe changes. And that is as true for the whole of society as it is for the individual. We all are what we all know today. What we knew yesterday was different, and so were we. So that's why this series is also going to look at the past, at the way we were because of what we knew that was different from today. And at how, through history, every time our view of the universe changed, and us with it, something was created that would help to make us the way we are in the modern world, with the distinctive way of thinking that makes us, us, and not some other bunch with a different view. Not some other bunch, thinking and acting differently. Us, the end product of centuries of change that thinks it's the best there is, just like all the others do. Every group, nation, tribe, cult, ideology, each one certain of its version of the truth, prepared, if necessary, to defend that version to the death, to keep it alive. And we are no different. We defend ours, a thousand feet down, here, below me, under that mountain. It doesn't matter whether it's a hermetically sealed, radiation-proof, high-tech place like this, or a stack of bows and arrows in a jungle hut. Every culture has one of these. It's where the truth is protected. This is what's meant by putting your money where your mouth is. It shows just how far you're prepared to go to defend your view of things. Here, as you can see, the attitude is quite far. It's the North American Air Defense Center inside Cheyenne Mountain. Any defense command center is where we define our boundaries, within which our view operates, and across which any threatening movement will start a war. Here, those boundaries extend far beyond national frontiers. They reach out into space. If how right your view is can be measured by the territory you defend, then this global defense makes this view about as right as you can get. But then we would think that, wouldn't we? So do all the others in their war rooms or jungle huts. And for everybody, the amount of effort you expend on defense enhances the value of your way of life. That effort here is maximal. A single multi-megaton nuclear warhead would wipe this place out, and the Russians could put one through the front door if they tried. Should it come from an offshore submarine, its flight time will be 10 minutes. Three to identify it as incoming, seven to react. To get countermeasures off the ground to handle whatever else follows the missile. All over the Western world, military forces train for what they would have to do in those first seven minutes. The numbers are massive. Four and a half million troops, 25,000 battle tanks, over 11,000 aircraft, an unknown number of nuclear warheads. The Soviet Union test launches 500 missiles a year. The next one could be real. Readiness is unquestioning. The entire system poised to go, perhaps for the first and last time, in reaction to the words nobody wants to hear. Unknown track. This is 
you have the command for it. Prepare to copy and print the traffic for missile warning. Time is... Defense Operations Center with an unknown track. Track number is Zulu 462. Time unknown 1930 Zulu. Course 130 degrees. Speed 420 knots. Altitude 28,000 feet. Identification none. F 15. Scrabble at a time of 1930 Zulu. So why are we so attached to being the way we are? So attached that all these people are prepared to die for it? Well, if you asked nine out of ten people in the West, they'd probably use the word freedom, wouldn't they? Freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of self-expression. Or maybe life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That and the fact that we think our version of things is the best version there is. Look back, as I'm going to in this series, to the moments when what we were changed because what we knew changed and you see how far we've come and also how each of those stages in the growth of our knowledge also brought into existence a vital bit of what it is we are today look In 11th century Arab Spain, these Christian crusaders made a discovery that led directly to the invention of the modern university degree. In 1420, we found a new way of painting that helped to give us in the modern world the ability to navigate our ships to a precise landfall anywhere on Earth or on another planet. Up to the 15th century, we memorized our knowledge in song or poetry. Then we invented a way to do without memory and as a result, ushered in today's standardized technological existence. Three hundred years ago, we believed the sky was made of crystal spheres. Then, around 1600, these gunners destroyed that glass universe and triggered the beginnings of modern science. For centuries, we handcrafted everything we needed. Then an 18th century religious misfit invented the power to move mountains and turned us all into compulsive consumers. French Revolutionary Wars brought into existence an obsession with gambling that was to make every 20th century Western citizen a healthy, long-living number. In the 19th century came discoveries about nature that